Tomorrow is B-Day, but Big Ben won't pong for Brexit. There will be a light show and commemorative 50p's. We asked some European campaigners, what does all this mean for the future? And conduct a debate between the Brexiteers and the pro-Europeans as to whether Britain as a European country is actually going to change all that much. Join us on The Alex Salmon Show, on air and online. Welcome to the Alex Salmon Show on the eve of B-Day, the day that Britain finally departs the European Union. After many false starts, Boris Johnson has got Brexit done, but it looks like the celebration of a new political dawn will be somewhat understated. We mark the day with an interview with Britain's longest serving MEP, Claude Moraes, who looks back with fondness at the concrete achievements of the European Parliament for working people. And we talk to the Secretary General of New Europeans, the pro-European campaigning group. Do they now pack up their tents? Then we'll ask two old Westminster hands, former Liberal Democrat presidential candidate and Brexiteer Lemit Opik, and former Plaid Cymru president and pro-European Lord Daffod Wigley to look to the future of Britain's European relationship. But first to your tweets, messages and emails and the mighty response we received to our programmes on Scotland's future and last week's show on the homeless. Tim says, amazing. Good guys out there, you never hear about doing something constructive to help the homeless. Gives you hope to see people doing this. Maureen says, it's amazing how such good intentioned people with a will in their hearts to make a difference can help those who have fallen on such hard times. They are brilliant and could teach us all how to be better people. Well said. Brian says, as someone that was homeless for three and a half years, it's great that homelessness is finally being shown that with help, people can have their lives changed. We never know what life holds for us. Alana says, so much admiration for the wonderful Sikh community who work hard to do this. I beautiful mean, souls, everyone. Indeed they are. And on Scotland, Sask's Asden says, Boris should be ashamed of himself. We have a right to our freedom. We have rights. Billy Hammett says, the 2021 Scottish Parliamentary or Holyrood elections should be fought on the basis that should the people of Scotland vote for it, a unilateral declaration of independence will be declared. That way, the UDI, if voted for, will be the undeniable democratic will of a sovereign nation. Alan says, I think Scotland should be out of the EU and of course the UK. However, Scotland should aim for being in EFTA. And finally, Selma from British Columbia says, the question really is, who is Boris? He says no, and the Scottish people who are already indeed voting with their feet, marching the streets, say yes, period. We need civil and government disobedience now. Come on, Nicola, what are we waiting for? Of course, tomorrow we'll be hearing from Nicola Sturgeon, Scotland's First Minister, as to her next steps. Tomorrow also marks B-Day which stands for Bitter Day for two of our strongest exponents of Britain's membership of the European Union. Alex talks to MEP for London, Claude Moraes, and to former Labour MP and Secretary General of the New Europeans, Roger Caselli. And I'm delighted to welcome back to the show Claude Moraes, Britain's senior member of the European Parliament, joining us from Brussels. Welcome back to the show, Claude. It's great to be on again, Alex. Now, Claude Moraes, we're one day away from the, the, the leaving of the institution, the Britain's 70 plus MEPs pack their bags and leave Brussels. What's the atmosphere like as you, as you bid farewell to that institution that you've been a member of for more than 20 years? To be honest, Alex, it's a mixture of, um, on the one hand, quite sombre, um, and on the other hand, sort of business as usual. The sombre nature of it is that there's a, a hard core of parliamentarians here have been here for a long time who know the kind of British contribution, contribution from all parts of Britain. And I think that has created a kind of sombre atmosphere, uh, genuinely. And in terms of business as usual, there are lots of new members, lots of people feeling, well, this thing has gone on for a long time. 
you know, let's, let's get on with things. So it's a kind of mix of those things. Um, and also, you know, there have been so many false starts. So kind of this idea that, my God, is it actually going to happen? Um, so I would say that that's also an element of it. You rightly say, Claude Moraes, that people have struggled often to, to work out what contribution MEPs uh, are doing. Now, you've chaired key committees in the European Parliament. Can you give a, an example of how the work in the European Parliament has made a, a real difference to the lives of ordinary people in the United Kingdom? Um, I, I've worked in, in you know, the protection of um, workers, so for a long time in employment. Many of the employment um, legislation measures that we saw, agency workers, working time, health and safety, many of these things happened here, not because we couldn't do it, and I was involved in many of these things, but because the world has become more global and it was right to do these things because we had a single market and to benefit people back home um, in a much more fragile working environment where you've got zero hours contracts, where you've got more fragility, you needed to have workers' rights. It's not a free market, it's a single market. And it's a global economy where people are in a, a much more difficult, precarious position. So this place, while I've been here, has really powered ahead on that. Um, you know, in addition to any good that is done in the member states. So I don't think that was very understood. That's an area I've been involved in. And of course, um, I've been involved in, in a very visceral area, which is uh, the whole area of refugees, immigration, migration, um, the rule of law, um, and high tech areas, artificial intelligence, data protection, and so on, which again show the European Union in its kind of advanced um, elements. Um, again, I fear not always communicated back home, um, but there have been real practical benefits, I feel, over the years. And I wish that that had been communicated better back home. And that's, of course, our fault too. The Prime Minister, Boris Johnson, is very bullish about this. He says, oh, well, we can protect the rights of workers in our own parliament in Westminster. Do you not take Boris at his word, Claude? <laughs> well, you see, what I think is going to happen is I think... He's a populist, and I think what he's going to do is he's going to do a lot of post-Brexit marketing, um, as populists do. And you saw that um, yesterday when there's a new global visa for the world for people of talent to come here. And all this was was a, was a measure which already exists for talented people to come to the UK. And he took the cap off, and that cap had never been reached. So this is the kind of thing we're going to see. And he's going to say lots of things. Um, about Britain and about our global place in the world and how we're free and all of this stuff is going to happen. And it's going to be tough because it's going to denigrate anything that the EU ever did um, that was positive for the UK. Partly, Alex, as you know, because a lot of that never hit the narrative. It did, I would say, in, in, in places like Scotland. I would say it did. And that was reflected in the voting. Uh, in the referendum, but it certainly didn't in my part of the world, and it and I think that was the, the worry. So I think you're going to see this kind of revisionism, if you like. Um, it's all ready to go. I mean, we're actually still in the EU for a year. We're in the single market. We're in the customs union. We're going to be prosperous because of that. But I think in a year's time, two years' time, three years' time, the effects of being out of the single market will be seen. But believe me, um, this government, uh, this Prime Minister will make hay in this coming year because people will be confused. Are we in the EU? Are we out? Actually, we're going to still be in. Um, I'll be out, uh, people like me, but we're actually still in the infrastructure of the EU. So that prosperity issue will, will still be there. As you're aware, the, the Prime Minister is having some sort of light show in the Downing Street tomorrow to to mark Britain's departure. Is there any ceremony taking place in the European Parliament? Is there anything to, to mark uh, Britain's uh, leaving of the institution? I think the, the way that European Parliament authorities have played this has been very mature and sensible. They're not celebrating because they don't believe there's anything great to celebrate. And I was quoted in The Observer um, on Sunday just 
explaining why that's a better way to do it than light shows and so on, when you've still got a divided country and people who feel very bruised by this decision. So finally, Claude Moraes, I'm going to ask you to, to get your crystal ball out. With all your experience in the European Parliament, your knowledge of the debate on Europe, do you think this is a, a sad farewell tomorrow? Or do you think perhaps it's a, an optimistic abiento? I think it's inevitably it's going to be uh, deeply sad. Uh, but I think for the younger generation coming up who have not been tainted by this 30-year denigration in our country of the EU, of people in places like Scotland where there was a different, more or less different view, I think there's more optimism. I think that maybe one day, um, you know, we could see the European Union again um, as our natural partner. It will take time. So I think deep sadness as we leave, but just a hint of light that maybe one day we'll come back home. Claude Moraes uh, from Brussels for the last time as a member of the European Parliament, but not, I hope, the last time on this show. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Alex. Roger Casale, former Labour MP and Secretary General of the New Europeans. Welcome back to the Alex Salmon Show. Thank you, Alex. Great to be with you again. Now, Roger, Boris Johnson, tomorrow, is minting millions of 50p coins. He's having a light show to, to celebrate Britain's departure from the European Union. What's the New Europeans going to do? Well, my response to that, Alex, is never mind the 50p coin. What about the rights of the 5 million? the 3.6 million EU citizens living in the UK whose lives are in limbo and the 1.4 million, let's not forget the 1.4 million British citizens living elsewhere in the EU. And Brexit may be going ahead, but unfortunately, we're still in a situation where the rights of the 5 million are not fully guaranteed and protected. And Brexit doesn't mean and certainly should not be allowed to mean that their rights should be compromised in any way. But are you marking tomorrow, B-Day, are you marking it with some sort of ceremony? We will be doing that, Alex. We will have a very clear message, don't make citizens pay the price of Brexit. We will be holding a silent march through Westminster before the big Brexit party begins. And we will then hold a candlelit billet vigil by the statue of the suffragette Millicent Fawcett, holding her banner, Courage Calls to Courage Everywhere, to remind people watching that Brexit may be going ahead, but citizens' rights are still not guaranteed. And we will be having our own light show, not just our candlelit vigil, the lights of the candles, but we will be inviting people across Britain at the moment that Britain leaves the European Union to light a candle and put it in their window as a symbol of our rights and that they should never be extinguished. But Roger Casale, isn't the game up? Uh, wouldn't a Brexiteer say to you, it's time to pack up your bags and go home? A Brexiteer would say that to me, but that's to confuse the argument about whether Britain's in the EU or not, which obviously for the moment is settled. I do believe Britain will join one day in the future. But for now, what we need to do is for the nation to come together. This is a historic and important day for the nation. It's a very sad day from my perspective, but I accept that it is a historic day. But it doesn't mean, and it should not mean, and that's the focus of my message and our message from New Europeans, that citizens' rights should be compromised in any way. And we will continue to fight for full guarantees a physical proof of status for EU citizens in the UK and free movement rights for British citizens in the EU through our green card proposal. And I will be in Strasbourg in the, uh, in, in, at the plenary session and in Brussels talking to MEPs. As, as British MEPs leave the EU, we will still be on the front line talking to MEPs in Europe, trying to get a good deal for British citizens in the EU as the negotiations start over the future relationship and working hard in the UK uh, in solidarity with EU citizens here to make sure they get that physical proof of status which they will need to counter discrimination. And we would like to see a green, green card in the hand of EU citizens in the UK and the same green card in the hand of British citizens who are already re uh, resident in, in, in the EU. And finally, Roger Casale, what would you say to a, a Brexiteer MP at Westminster, the Palace of Westminster, which you know very well, just newly elected in an election which decided the issue, collecting his or her 50p celebratory coins and looking forward to a mid-Atlantic vision of the Singapore that Britain can become. What would your message to them be? My message to them 
is a very simple one, and it's my message to you and to your listeners watching. Uh, Brexit does not mean that citizens' rights should be compromised. Don't make citizens pay the price of Brexit. Ring fence and protect their rights completely, comprehensively. Give them a physical proof of status in the form of green, a green card and protect the rights, work with the EU to protect the rights of British citizens in the EU. Roger Casale from Italy, thank you very much for joining us on the show. Thank you, Alex. Join us after the break, where we'll look into a crystal ball to examine Britain's future role in Europe. Welcome back. Now, when Big Ben does not bong tomorrow night at 11 p.m., it will mark the end of Britain's near half century in an umbilical relationship with Europe. But is this the end or just the beginning of the end? And what of the future? Who better to discuss it than born again Brexiteer Lemmet OPEC and lifelong European Lord Daffod Wigley? Lemmet OPEC, to the, the victor goes to spoils. <laughs> Where will you be tomorrow? I mean, has the Prime Minister invited you to his light show of celebration? He hasn't not invited me. But I'm going to be with the people. I'm going to be in Parliament Square with other Brexiteers celebrating the inevitable. So at 2311 p.m. in Old Money, when the chimes, or the pretend chimes, I'm not sure Big Ben's working yet, uh, go, I'll be there and uh, I'll be commemorating or celebrating the new independent Britain. Well, I can put your mind at rest. Apparently, Big Ben isn't bonging. But, Daphne, <laughs> don't you think this celebration is kind of rubbing it in a bit? Will you be drowning your sorrows with some of that excellent Welsh whiskey? I uh, ask not for who the bell tolls <laughs> or for who the Ben bongs, I suppose, would be the same in this case. Oh, we have excellent Welsh whiskey, uh, most certainly, but I won't be celebrating. Um, but we have to accept. We are where we are. And the question is, how do we move on? I've always said that it's the next battle that matters, not the last one. The last one was fought in the general election, a very unwise election. Plaikum revoted against it. I wish uh, other parties had done so. We have given it on a plate to Boris Johnson, but now we have to find a way out without losing our connections with Europe, but accepting that we're not going to be in the European Union. OK, so let's look at the next year first, because obviously what Boris and uh, yourself are celebrating tomorrow is just the withdrawal agreement. Mm. We've got to work out the... The future, and, and, and Johnson says it can be done in a year. It can be the 31st of December, uh, and the, the new agreement for the future will be drawn up. Is that credible? Well, as a Democrat, you know that I think that Johnson is justified in having his mandate because the country voted for Brexit. So there's no going back now. That debate has, as David says, been decided. That war is over. But he's got problems. Even though I think we do have to leave now, and we have to do it in a sensible way, 12 months isn't enough. I predict that on the first day of our independence, on the 1st of February, everything's going to be the same. Gravity will still work. The sun will rise from the east. And those who expect a massive change, for better or worse, won't get it. The pound's not going to shift around a lot, for example. And there'll be a degree of disappointment and, I think, frustration, especially on the Brexit side. It's going to take years, not one year, to do it. But let the fun begin. So yeah. what are you worried about, Lord Wigley? Nothing's going to happen. <laughs> Everything's going to be the same. Well, of course, something's going to happen. People are going to get more and more irritated and those on the right wing of the Conservative Party who are agitating for a hard Brexit, as time goes on and it becomes clear that Boris Johnson is going to have to compromise, this won't be clear next week, but it'll be clear by the end of the year, and it will go on beyond the 31st of December and on and on. At that point, there will be massive frustrations, and I think that things that look so solid for the Prime Minister now will start falling apart. His friends will desert him. Uh, Mr Trump already um, doubtful about Boris with the business with the Huawei um, uh, issue this week. They are going to uh, desert Boris, and he will find it very, very hard, to my mind, to last five years. But he has, a, as you rightly say, I mean, the opposition parties unknowingly give him the huge Christmas present of a big majority in the House of Commons, which is counts. I mean, your Lord has been emasculated. Apparently, you're going to all get sent to York. <laughs> yes, <laughs> Is there a, a candidate for the grand old duke? 
Yes, yeah, so well, I uh, won't be marching up a hill, but York, of course, has an underground um, city that was uh, discovered, Yorvik, and perhaps it's an underground uh, House of Lords second chamber that should be based in York. That wasn't but a Welsh city, look, was it? <laughs> look, we'll decide where the House of Lords goes when it's been democratised mm -hmm. and we have a second chamber that has been elected by people and not one that uh, uh, is on the basis uh, it is now. But the point is, um, the... the but the, the, from a situation where the House of Lords and indeed the, the anti-Brexit forces in the Commons held sway, Boris Johnson is now master of all his surveys in the House of Commons. The House of Lords has been emasculated, indeed opposition. Do well, things really go wrong this year for Johnson? No, they can't. And while I understand everyone wants to declare what we might call a, a Brexit change emergency, we're not in an emergency situation. There's no crisis for Boris Johnson here. Uh, as I predicted here, actually, on your show, he did get uh, the majority that seemed pretty obvious to any serious commentator weeks before the election. So he's got his 80-seat insurance policy. He can even make some pretty serious mistakes. Lord Bigley, I mean, you know, you're both uh, old Westminster hands. Well, let's look a wee bit further into the future. I mean, you think there will be problems for, for the Prime Minister as this relationship tries to get reset. But what is the, the medium term? How does Britain's position uh, change as a result of Brexit? Well, quite clearly, there will be changes with regard to Britain's voice in the world. We won't be talking through the European Union. We won't be talking with friends in America, necessarily. We'll be having to try and establish some presence, which uh, um, is a challenge. But uh, uh, it's, the, the, the whole situation isn't going to be frozen in aspic. The question of Ireland, for example, is going to be a massive one. Because the people of Ireland are not going to be happy, the people of the North aren't going to be happy with uh, having um, a different relationship um, to Europe to that that Britain has. And there will be undoubtedly pressures for the reunification of Ireland. And this is going to move things on. You know better than I do what the situation is in Scotland. And therefore, give a year, and we're likely to find things starting to bubble up that I think Boris Johnson will find very difficult to handle. Okay. But, 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 but Daft Wigley's point, uh, the National Assembly in Wales, the, the reconvened uh, Assembly in Stormont, mm. the Scottish Parliament, mm. virtually simultaneously last week, all said, no, we don't want this Brexit. Does that not count for anything? Well, in Wales, as you know, David, the majority voted for Brexit, so the Assembly is not speaking for the nation. Uh, in Scotland... Well, hold on, hold on. The, it wasn't about accepting Brexit or not. It was about the withdrawal agreement as drawn up. It's a question how you bring in the National Assembly, the Welsh Government, the Scottish Government, on issues such as the resources that used to come from Europe for the Objective One programmes that you uh, um, yeah. undoubtedly um, worked on years ago. Um, that is the challenge now. And that is what both um, Edinburgh and Cardiff are standing up. I think yeah. Northern Ireland was slightly as different. A, as a former proud yeah. Welsh Liberal Democrat <laughs> member of Parliament, surely you appreciate the, the rights of the nation yeah. of Wales. Yeah, and that is right. That is the technical challenge here. But that's not what it looks like. Let's get back down to what the uh, real politique here is, what the people in the street who don't sit on programmes like this talking with you are thinking. They're saying, well, we've done Brexit. Let's get on to everything else. And things that directly affect them, like, for example, for the farmers, this is going to be a big issue. But by and large, most things won't change. Now, Boris Johnson has another benefit, and you've mentioned it. He's somehow got the Northern Ireland Assembly going. That's a huge plus, much more than just Brexit. There are problems uh, in terms of the uh, North and South. And in the Ireland. first problem for Boris Johnson is it reconvened and voted against his withdrawal agreement. And I'd have expected that also in Scotland and Wales. That's good politics. But the big picture is back to that that most important number for Boris Johnson, 80. 80 seat majority. He can do what he likes. And of course, if Northern Ireland causes a problem, then he'll do what they always do there. They put enough money into the public sector there to get wins for everybody. And that should keep things fairly stable for the next 12 months. Daph Wigley, if you had to put your finger on where you think the, the ice... Let's think of, of Boris Johnson as a as the Titanic. I think he once described Brexit was going to be a Titanic success, if I remember correctly. So Boris Johnson is it that where where's his iceberg? Where do you think the issue is going to, to come up that might be his undoing? It's with regard to manufacturing industry and their right to export to the Euro European market without tariffs. If that is the case, then they have to accept the European standards. They've already flagged up that they don't want to do that. When they find that they have to do so, many on the Tory right are going to be unhappy. If they um, do so and go down that road, 
a manufacturing industry uh, may well um, uh, be all right, but if they don't, manufacturing industry will be at the next. So one way or the other, that is the Morton's Fork. And Lima, I mean, you think pretty plain sailing for the Prime Minister initially, but mm. can you see problems in the horizon? Yeah, that, that is right. The biggest single issue is trade. I think the way that Boris Johnson gets through the, the trade issue, which you rightly raise as the biggest one, is a kind of uh, zero-sum game. We pay £12 billion worth of tariffs out. They pay £12 billion of tariffs back in. So you look like you've changed something, but you haven't really. We can't really stay in the customs union. I don't think Boris can deliver that. But I do think that the European Union wants this big, profitable, sixth biggest economy in the world to be friends with them. And that's why I think we'll fudge it, but we'll fudge it in a way that works. But it's not just about the tariffs. It's about the standards and the monitoring that may take place in the ports when goods are moving backwards and forwards. You think uh, of the building of, of the aircraft uh, in Flintshire, when parts are made in Germany, parts are made in, in France, it's moving about of the wings and all the rest. Um, if things are held up in a just-in-time economy, um, when they're coming into the UK, that is going to cause immense problem but, for manufacturing industry. But, but they won't. You can fly from here to New York and stop in Shannon, do all your passport controls there and walk off. I'm talking about goods. Yes, yes, but you can do the same principle with goods. Uh, I went to the Airbus factory quite a lot up in North Wales mm. and they've got it all sorted out. And frankly, that is a and bit of a paper tiger. Do you think the Prime Minister's in command of that sort of detail? Uh, no, he's, he's not a detailed person, but he knows people who are, and the people who are, are the ones in those industries who are going to make this work. Uh, Horace Walpole once said, now they're ringing the bells, soon they'll be ringing their hands. So, <laughs> a year's time, will it be hand ringing or bell ringing for Johnson? Well, he won't be ringing his hands. He might be down to 76 majority. It's still pretty good. Uh, the best majority the Tories have had since the 1980s. And I do hope the bell will toll, because Big Ben's been out for long enough. Lord Wigley? It'll be trepidation for him. He will watch the new year coming in on the 31st of December, uncertain how it's going to work out. And during the subsequent months, I think there could be a significant change in the political balance. Daffy Wigley, Lambert Opic, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you. The end of an old sang described how the Scots Parliament gave up its independence in 1707. There is nothing as poetic about the severing of Britain's political relationship with Europe after almost half a century. Little fanfare, no street parties, just a fireside chat with Boris Johnson. A few million 50p's and a light display, not even a contribution from Big Ben. Britain leaves Europe not with a bong, but a whimper. There are perhaps three reasons for this. First, there's an atmosphere of resignation after more than three and a half years of inconclusive debate, followed by a very conclusive general election. Secondly, there's a realisation that the withdrawal agreement is merely the end of the beginning. There will be many cliff edges yet to come before the future relationship with the European Union is properly established. And the cliff edges look like looming larger for Britain than the rest, with even the very political survival of the United Kingdom at risk. Thirdly, there might just be the recognition that while the politics of the European Union is changing, the geography of being part of Europe will not. That is a reality which will continue to shape our political and economic ends, rough hew them how politicians will. Perhaps after all is said and done, this huge kerfuffle might become a case of plus ça change, plus c'est la même chose. Next week, we turn from the future of Europe to the future of Labour. Who will win the race for what even one of the candidates calls the worst job in UK politics? But for now, from Alex, myself and all at the team, we hope to see you next week.